Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We're going to talk about our next exception to the law of dominance. That's going to be called polygenic inheritance. All right, polygenic is going to mean two or more, but it's not going to be just two or more different alleles this time. It's actually going to be two or more completely different genes that are all going to work together and contribute towards the same trait, just one trait. So some examples of that are in humans is skin color, hair color, and height. We obviously just don't have one, two, or three versions of a trait. We have this big, huge range from, let's say, really light skin to really dark skin or really light eyes to really dark eyes, super short to super tall. Obviously, something is controlling how all of that works, and that is what we call polygenic inheritance. Now, with a polygenic inheritance problem, our number one goal is to figure out how much does each dominant allele from a gene contribute to that specific trait. So you could have, for example, three genes, A gene, B gene, and C gene. And for each one, they're going to have a dominant version of themselves and a recessive version of themselves for all three genes. What we want to figure out is how much to a trait does a dominant A contribute or a dominant B or a dominant C. And all three of these, even though they're different genes, will contribute equally to that specific trait. Now, how does that really work? Let me show you an example here. So let's focus on eye color again right here. In this instance, we're pretending that eye color is only controlled by two genes, an A and a B gene. It's way more than just two genes in a human, but this will make it a little bit more simplistic for ourselves. Now, what you can get when you have two genes for eye color, you could be someone who is homozygous dominant for it or homozygous recessive for it. Now, if you're homozygous dominant, you're going to have the darkest color eyes possible, as I'm showing you right here. If you have the lightest color eyes, you're going to be homozygous recessive for all genes involved. In this instance, there's only two. So there's our two extremes, really dark brown eyes and really, really light blue eyes. That means all the variation, all the play is in between those two extremes, and it's going to be dictated on what your ultimate genotype is. So for example, if I focus right here in this box, and I say that's a light brown colored eye, that individual's genotype is big A, little a, big B, little b. They're heterozygous for both genes, but really they have just two dominant alleles between their four allele possibilities total. If I look at the individual to the right who also has the same colored eyes, their genotype is two little a's. They're homozygous recessive for gene A, but then they're homozygous dominant for gene B. Their genotypes are completely different, but they have the exact same eye color. That's because each gene is contributing equally. So as long as you have two dominant alleles in this instance, no matter which genes they're on, you're going to have a light brown colored eye. Same thing for these other two. If I go all the way up to the top right, I have a big A, little a, a big B, little b. I have an individual heterozygous for both genes again. They have two big or dominant alleles. They have the light colored brown eyes. So it's all about how many dominant alleles do you have total. If we looked at the medium blue eyes, right here I have big A, uh, little a, and then two little b's. I only have one dominant allele for the medium blue eyes. And down here for this color eyes, you're going to see it's going to be the same scenario, but I'm homozygous recessive for gene A, and then I have one big B, lowercase b. Again, just one dominant allele gives me that medium blue eye color. Now, once you wouldn't take notice in this image is pretty much the majority of versions of a polygenic trait will be in the middle. So that's going to be everyone who's like average height or average eye color, skin color, etc. While your extremes, generally those are the fewest individuals. There's not so many people out there in the world who are eight feet tall. There's only so many people out there in the world who are four feet tall. The majority are in between. 
All right, so when you look at polygenic traits, the majority are in the middle, whatever that average particular trait is going to be. All right, let's put this to work. Let's try to figure out a problem and see how this is going to work for your homework. So it says in this problem here, we have height is controlled by three genes, A, B, and C. Now an individual who is homozygous dominant for all three genes can be no taller than 110 centimeters. That's the extreme for the tallest you could be. While an individual who is homozygous recessive for all three genes, genes their extreme on the low end is 50 centimeters tall. So all the play in these individuals is going to be between 110 centimeters and 50 centimeters tall. Now, what the problem is asking is, if a 110 centimeter tall male is crossed with a 50 centimeter tall female, how tall will their offspring be? So, to make this a little simplistic, if I look over at the diagram, the tall individual is homozygous dominant for all three genes. And if I FOIL that, there's really only one A possibility, one B possibility, one C possibility. They can produce a sperm that is big A, big B, big C. That was the male. While the female was 50 centimeters tall, so that means she was homozygous recessive for all three genes. She only has one possibility for each gene she could give, so her only egg cell could be little a, little b, little c. So if I combine those two gametes together, I get an individual, their offspring is going to be heterozygous for A, heterozygous for B, and heterozygous for C. That's their genotype, but how tall are they actually going to be? To do this, you got to follow the steps I have over here. All right, so for step number one, you want to determine, so I'm over here, how many centimeters in this instance does each dominant allele contribute to a person's overall height? To do that, you're going to use the formula listed. You're going to take the maximum height, which is 110 centimeters, subtract from that the minimum possibility for height, which is 50, and then you're going to divide that by the total possible alleles that an individual can have. Now there's three genes here in this example. Gene A, gene B, and gene C. Each one has two alleles, so you're going to have a total of six alleles. So each dominant allele, if I figure this out, 110 minus 50 is 60 centimeters. Divided by 6 alleles, so 60 divided by 6 is 10 centimeters. So each dominant allele contributes 10 centimeters to an individual's height. So now we just need to figure out, right over here, how tall is this individual? So what I like to do is, I like to first count how many dominant alleles does this individual have. In this instance, we have 1, 2, three of the six possibilities three of them are a dominant allele the shortest an individual can be we know up here all right is only 50 centimeters so in my head an individual can be 50 centimeters shortest that's it but now what i'm going to do is i'm going to add to that 10 centimeters for every dominant allele that the individual has so the offspring are going to be heterozygous for all three genes. So they have one, two, three dominant alleles. I already figured out that each dominant allele contributes 10 centimeters. So I'm going to then do, in essence, 10 centimeters times three dominant alleles. So 10 times 3 is 30. Add 30 centimeters to 50, and our offspring height is going to be 80 centimeters tall. 
right? So again, all I did was I thought, okay, the shortest somebody can be is 50. The offspring are going to be heterozygous for all three genes. I just added 10 onto 50 for every dominant allele that was present, and we got 80 centimeters. Now, this was pretty much as easy as it can get with two parents that were pure for either being really tall or really short. But you might get some examples where, if I look at this, what if I take a parent who is this genotype and cross them with this one for the exact same type of problem? Now, it looks like, oh my God, this is going to be like 30-something boxes I have to figure out, but, but no, you don't have to do it that way. Just think of it this way. We can still FOIL it. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to underline for each gene, I'm going to underline the whole thing if there's only one possibility. So there's only one big A for this parent, one big C, or a big B, or a little B for this parent. So that means this parent can produce the following sperm or egg cells. Big A with big B or big C, or big A with little b, big C. So it's not going to be this... A, noxious amount of possible gametes, you really only have two choices. The other parent only has one option for the A gene, one option for the B gene, but then they have two for the C. So their sperm or egg cells would be little a, little b, big C, or little a, little b, little c. So if you did a pun and square for this, you would really only honestly have to do four individual or four boxes. And if you filled out a Punnett square box, let's just say I do it for this possible gamete with this one, I would get an individual who is heterozygous for the A gene, heterozygous for the B gene, and homozygous dominant for the C gene. So this individual would have one, two, three, four dominant alleles. Now, if I use what we just did in the previous problem, I know the shortest an individual could be when they're homozygous recessive is 50 centimeters. We know that each dominant allele from above contributes 10 centimeters. So 4 times 10 centimeters is 40. I'm going to add 40 centimeters then to the minimum, which is 50. And I know this individual right here would be 90 centimeters tall. And you would do that for every single possible offspring that you figure out in your Punnett square as well. All right, thank you very much. If you have any questions, please contact me as soon as you can.